I was a suicidal teenager and very depressed. I probably needed a therapist, but that wasn't like available. It was depression for sure. And, and then being in that mindset, that radical jihadist Islamic mindset made me more depressed. So I grew up in London. My parents were born in Bangladesh and they came to the UK in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they weren't very religious at the time. But I radicalized during my teenage years. I was having um, problems in high school. In the, my new circle of friends, they were very practicing Muslim girls, very sweet girls too. They were very anti-Western. They were supporters of bin Laden and the Taliban. I thought if I was to be um, more religious, um, I would be. I would have better luck in my life. And I, I really liked having this sense of belonging because I had felt so much rejection in the past from being bullied in, in high school. Plus, growing up in England, I was always told I'm an outsider. I don't know one single Asian, Indian subcontinental Asian kid that hasn't been beaten up for being non-white in London. In my eyes, these were such good girls because they weren't drinking, they weren't promiscuous, they were very modest, and I, I admired that. Then they would invite their brothers and sisters or relatives to come preach to us during our lunch breaks. And yeah, it was very homophobic rhetoric, very anti-Western. And we were such big conspiracy theorists. The Jews were to blame for everything. There were Muslim friends who weren't interested in hearing these preachers come. Sometimes they would join us and they'll be like, no, it's too hateful. This is just hate speech. But we just thought they were bad Muslims and were too westernized. We thought they were brainwashed. I also had a cousin who went to Oxford University. She went to university being a normal girl. And I idolized her because everybody loved her. But when she went to Oxford, she became radicalized. She started wearing the hijab and preaching the caliphate. And she made it sound glorious and it was like the best time for any Muslim. And I wanted that. I was looking for a cause because I, I really needed meaning in my life. And I never was born and raised to believe I was free. I wasn't allowed to integrate. I wasn't allowed to just live like a normal teenager. I wasn't allowed to do the things I wanted to do. Like, uh, you know, just, I wasn't expected to reach my fullest potential. My, I was taught, you grow up, go to school, get married, have children, that's your life. But I could have been so much more. Uh, and I love being a mother and I love being a wife, but that could have waited. You know, I didn't have to rush into it. So I met John in 2003 online. He's my ex-husband who went on to be one of the founders of ISIS. We were on a marriage website. It was for marriage only, not dating, because there was no dating allowed. And I liked him because he was an American and he spoke Arabic fluently. I married John at 19, we were both 19 years old, and he was a convert to Islam. He had left Christianity to become a Muslim. I thought he was like Robin Hood, just like he rejected having an American life, living an upper middle class family. He could have been anything, but he chose Islam. We all put him on a pedestal, and so he felt very entitled too. Yeah, so, John and I dreamt of having lots of sons, seven sons to take over seven continents was the joke. And I wanted them to be intellectually strong. I wanted them to be more intelligent than the enemies of Islam. I wanted them to, to be tough um, because I wanted them to be um, conquerors. And even while my youngest was still pretty young, I was still thinking, my purpose is to raise these children to be holy warriors for God. They've got to be prepared to fight and kill, and they have to be prepared to be killed for the sake of God. I would read them stories of the prophets and just like, I was brainwashing them saying, if you don't, if you don't live and serve and die for God, then you're going to be like the rest of the disbelievers who just get tortured in hell forever which is a really cruel thing to teach a child. And I only saw that as something honorable. I thought that they would be my ticket to paradise too, because if they go to heaven, they can ask for family members to go to heaven too. And I was 
depending on them really to go to paradise. Uh, it was during 2008, 2009. I would watch PBS, I would MSNBC and Fox Business. So I wanted to hear what everyone was saying. Um, but it was Fox Business when they would, would have uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano speaking or when Ron Paul would speak about the US Constitution and American values that it, it sparked like a light in my head and, and a light bulb went off. Like I just realized, I what am I doing with my life? and I want to be free. I had been starved from freedom for several years and it was killing me inside. So on one hand, I was told I have to suffer my whole life to be worthy to go to paradise. And then this other value system, this more enlightened value system was saying, reach your potential, be happy, be successful, have a family, you know, live freely, be, you know, it was, it was, it's, it's like, what human wouldn't want these things? But at the same time, it conflicted with Islam because the Founding Fathers' principles were man-made and I was told that Islam, Islamic values are from Allah, it's from God, and you can't contradict God. So I was living in great conflict at the time. Uh, what made me change was the desire to see my children survive and thrive. I just didn't want to, I, I didn't want to bury one of my children. Um, also, I wanted them to um, contribute to life, not kill it off and destroy it. So that was, a, was something that John and I just really just couldn't see eye to eye. I thought we had agreed not to go to Syria because I have children and I wasn't there mentally. Like I was already losing my faith. I was only married to John because he wouldn't give me a divorce. And in Islam, a wife needs her husband's permission to get a divorce. And he wasn't going to give it to me. Um, so, and I was financially dependent on him. I was, I didn't, I, it was crazy. I was pretty much his property. That's like, wherever he went, he dragged me with him. And so he took us to Syria one night on a bus. And as soon as I got a hold of a, a cell phone, I, I took John's cell phone in front of him and I called his mother and I said, please get in contact with the FBI agent that arrested John in 2006 and ask her, you know, ask, tell her that we need to get out of here because you're not going to have one American terrorist on your hands. You're going to end up having five. He's going to, I know he's going to make my children into child soldiers. So at that time, luckily, it was 10 months before ISIS had declared a caliphate. So that's why I was able to get out and not be charged for joining a terrorist organization. The problem with extremism is that it's a very binary outlook on life. And this world is not that way. It's, there's nuances, there's, there's shades of gray and, and there's psychology involved. And we can't dismiss science and and data for an ideology that is so black and white. So what helped de-radicalize me was um, taking courses online. I took um, a counter-terrorist course online, which showed a lot of statistics about how terrorist organizations always fail. It doesn't ever win. And facts and statistics, you can't argue with those things. People get tired of war, people get fed up of the killing, and they just want to live in peace. So after 2014, John went on to become ISIS's chief propagandist. I did help law enforcement with tracking John. I felt that it was important for me to help the law enforcement because I owed the US government my life and my loyalty. And, you know, they, they gave me and my children the chance to live and survive from Syria. We could be dead if it wasn't for the US government. I'm living proof that people can be de-radicalized if they're educated properly. It worked for me, it's worked for my children. You do it through teaching them humanism, how violence never actually solves problems. It just becomes a cycle of hate and, and war constantly. I'm a de-radicalization expert and consultant. I came out with my story to help prevent other youth from going down a road of radicalization and destroying their lives and destroying other people's lives. To ensure you keep receiving Clarion Project's free videos, click the subscribe button right next to me.